This is a story about an awakening and finding fulfillment. In my research career as a physician scientist, everything was going as planned. I was studying new treatments for critically ill patients in intensive care units. My work was meaningful to me, and my research, research program was hitting every uh, milestone for success. I was publishing my work in some of the best journals, receiving research grants from the National Institutes of Health, and being invited to speak in scientific conferences all over the world. But then, an unexpected question from a 12-year-old turned everything upside down and literally made me change the trajectory of my life's work. That 12-year-old was my son. He was in seventh grade, and one evening he came into my study at home, and he asked me for help. Dad, I know you give a lot of talks. I have to give a talk for my, my class at school. Can you help me prepare my talk? Of course, I said, sit down. What is your talk about? And he reached into his bag, and he pulled out the assignment sheet, and he put it on my desk, and this was the assignment for the talk. What is the most pressing problem of our time? I was taken aback. I don't know what you were doing in seventh grade. I was not doing what is the most pressing problem of our time. I said, okay, what you got? He said, okay, I've got these slides and these images and these references, so I think I'm almost there. Now, the topic that he selected was meaningful, but I wasn't buying it. I didn't believe that he believed that it was really the most pressing problem of our time. So I asked him, do you believe, do you really believe this is the most pressing problem of our time? Because if you don't really believe it, you're not going to convince anybody else. He said, um, okay, look, Dad, I just need to get this assignment done, okay? <laughs> and I have everything that I need to tell this story. I said, stop. Take some time and think. Of course, there's no one single most pressing problem of our time. But you need to find the most pressing problem of our time for you. So he left my study a bit frustrated, but he understood. And two nights later, after careful consideration, he returned with what he really believed was the most pressing problem of our time. Now, the topic he selected is not what's important. What's important is that he actually believed it. And so he prepared a talk that not only his classmates found compelling, but he did too. This mentoring experience gave me pause because as I was contemplating my life's work, I realized I was not taking my own advice. How do research scientists develop a successful career? Oftentimes it goes something like this. I'm at the University of ABC, and here we're famous for X, Y, Z, so that's what I'm going to work on. Or at my institution, we have a one-of-a-kind research instrument. No one else can get these data, so that's what I'm going to focus on. Or my mentor is Dr. Jones, who's a world-renowned expert and can open doors for me, so I'm going to do what he does. These are the blueprints for success. But do we actually believe that what we're working on is the most pressing problem of our time? And, more importantly, what would happen if we actually did? This led to a period of introspection for me. Was the research that I was working on at the time meaningful? Definitely. Did I believe I was working on the most pressing problem of our time? Definitely not. I had to find the most pressing problem of our time for me. But where? Dr. Martin Luther King once said, life's most urgent question is, what are you doing for others? And through that lens is where I ultimately found it for me. And it was, in fact, a departure from everything I'd been working on before. So I believe that the most pressing problem of our time is this. We are in the midst of a compassion crisis. Literally, a crisis. Scientists define compassion as an emotional response to another's pain or suffering involving an authentic desire to help. So it's different from sympathy or empathy, which are the feeling and understanding components, in that compassion also involves taking action. Compassion is integral to the belief system of just about every world religion, and it's been a fundamental moral imperative 
in almost every culture and civilization throughout history. But compassion is not just about morality. It's also rooted in science. Charles Darwin, in The Descent of Man, concluded that the communities with the greatest compassion for others would flourish the best and rear the most offspring. So compassion is actually evolutionary. But the available scientific evidence shows that we are currently having an erosion of compassion in our culture, an erosion. Let's go to the data. So numerous studies show that we are becoming more self-focused and less other-focused, and that shift is accelerating over time. A recent survey study found that half of Americans believe that our society is not compassionate and that we do not place a high value on compassion for others. A recent Harvard University study of 10,000 students in middle school and high school found that two-thirds of our students believe that their parents do not value compassion for others as much as they value achievements and accolades. And perhaps the most striking, in a recent Pew Research Center study, fully one-third of Americans admitted that they don't consider compassion for others to be in their core values. But what about health care? My domain. Health care is supposed to be different, but research shows there's a compassion crisis there too. A recent Harvard Medical School study found that 46% of Americans believe that our health care system and our health care providers are not compassionate. Numerous scientific studies have shown that physicians miss the vast majority of opportunities to respond to patients with compassion. And compassion comprises less than 1% of all physician communications with patients. Recent data from the Mayo Clinic shows that half of healthcare workers are so burned out that they're suffering from depersonalization, which is an inability to make a personal connection. And perhaps the most concerning for the future, a recent survey study found that almost two-thirds of physicians and nurses have observed a decline in compassionate care over time, specifically over the past five years. Based on all of these data, I conclude we have a compassion crisis, indeed. But that begs the question, so what? Does compassion really matter? Of course, there's a moral imperative. We ought to have compassion. But is compassion just an ought? Or are there also evidence-based effects belonging in the domain of science? To answer this for healthcare, I went to the biomedical literature and I applied a research methodology called systematic review. I synthesized the data for more than 1,000 scientific abstracts, more than 200 research studies. And what I found was nothing short of a scientific awakening for me an awakening. I found a robust and striking signal in the data, and that signal is this. Compassion matters. Compassion for patients is beneficial for health through better patient outcomes, beneficial for health care through higher quality care and lower costs, and beneficial for health care providers through promoting resilience and well-being and reducing burnout. Compassion matters indeed. I like to call this field compassionomics. It's the scientific evidence that caring makes a difference. The most pressing problem of our time for me through my lens of experience as a physician investigator is the compassion crisis in healthcare. And now my entire research program is focused on this. And I believe that compassionomics can be a methodology for meaningful change. And this is now my quest. My quest is to make healthcare more compassionate through science. Now, there can be substantial risk in pursuing the most pressing problem of our time. When I decided to refocus my research program on compassionomics, my closest collaborators thought I was crazy. They said things like, why mess with success? And and one colleague even said to me, you're throwing it all away. No, I'm not throwing it all away. 
quite the contrary. Because when you believe you're working on the most pressing problem of our time, it changes everything. And you realize that you can't spend one more minute working on anything else. When you know you're working on the most pressing problem of our time, you get out of bed differently in the morning. You put your feet on the floor differently with purpose. I've got to get up and go. The most pressing problem of our time is waiting for me. For the first time in my life, I don't need an alarm clock. Not anymore. It changes everything. Now, there's one thing I didn't tell you yet. There's a secret about pursuing the most pressing problem of our time. But before I tell you the secret, I want to tell you something else I found on my journey through the data for Compassionomics. And that is this, an amazing body of scientific evidence on an other-focused life. The scientific evidence that serving others is actually good for you. Now, for decades, scientists have known that serving others can produce a helper's high related to the release of circulating endorphins or activation of the nervous system in such a way that it buffers your own stress or activation of brain centers that are uh, reward centers in the brain that trigger positive emotion that can give you a a sense of inner calmness and an enhanced feeling of self-worth. Science shows that all these mechanisms... Science shows all these mechanisms can lead to an enhanced well-being and health for the one who serves. But that's not the most striking thing I found. The most striking thing I found was on happiness. Happiness. So neuroscience research using a brain imaging modality called functional MRI found that the most potent activator of brain circuits involved in the experience of human happiness is actually compassion for others. These data are in stark contrast, perhaps, to messages that you might hear from motivational speakers or success gurus or even commencement speakers at graduation time for college students. Those messages typically go something like this. Find your passion Chase your dream. Pursue your happiness, your passion, your dream, your happiness. Newsflash. That's actually terrible advice. Not because I say so, but because science says so. Science says it's terrible advice because in that mindset, it's all about you. And it leads you to a life focused on serving yourself rather than serving others. Instead, science says that to find your fulfillment, you ought to do this. Are you ready? Find the greatest need, the greatest need that you possibly can, and then go fill that need. Find a need that's much more important than you are. And then dedicate the rest of your life to it in service to others. And that brings me to the secret of the most pressing problem of our time. The secret is this. When you find the most pressing problem of our time, it will always, always lead you to serve. And that is where you will find your fulfillment. You already know what the most pressing problem of our time is for me. The question now is, what will it be for you? In closing, my message for you is this. Dare to take on the most pressing problem of our time through your lens of experience. Find it, commit to it, and then work relentlessly towards solving it every day. I promise it changes everything. This is my message and my wish for you. But this is also my message and my wish for the person who started me on this journey my son. Thank you.